Welcome everyone to this Reclaim Network Plus webinar series. So this is the webinar number four uh, in this series. And my name is Prashant Kumar. So I am uh, from the University of Surrey. And I'm joined with my um, co-investigators of the Reclaim Network. So we have uh, uh, Professor Lauren Jones and uh, Dr. Thomas Carlson today. So Dr. Carlson will be um, uh, chairing the Q&A session. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So, um, so just to give a very quick overview that uh, this is a 18, uh, you know, the webinar series, uh, which we started, uh, you know, the earlier this year, and this is gonna go until March, 2024. And we have been inviting, you know, the speakers from academic and non-academic, uh, you know, the backgrounds try to bring the, uh, you know, the, the, the topic areas uh, together. So today, um, we have two speakers, but uh, uh, if you can see the webinar three, we got uh, uh, the colleagues from the US and uh, uh, from the UK. But this is also an open, uh, you know, the invitation to the colleagues. So if they are interested in uh, doing a webinar, you can just drop us an email and we'll be very happy to, uh, you know, consider you there. So for the today's webinar, without much further ado, we have uh, two of our speakers. So I'm going to introduce uh, Richard first. So, um, so Richard is, uh, um, uh, uh, the founder and managing director of Biotecture, a company on a mission to bring nature back into our urban environments for the good of the planet, people and business. So Richard had over 30 years of experience in sustainable construction, civil engineering and green infrastructure. But before I pass on to him, uh, just uh, a few notes that uh, you can ask your questions. Please use the Q&A box on the bottom and you can type your questions with your name and affiliation. So um, uh, Thomas is going to pick your questions and read out for you with your name and affiliation to the uh, to the speakers. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, it will be made available uh, through our uh, Reclaim Network YouTube channel. You can see the, the previous webinar there as well. Uh, so yeah, with that, I would like to uh, pass on to Richard. Many thanks, Prashant, for inviting me to uh, speak with the Reclaim Seminar people here. This is fantastic. Um, obviously, we are working in uh, construction um, and have been trying to introduce green infrastructure into construction uh, for the past 15 years. So I just wanted to take you through some of the things that we do um, and also with the provocative title of not just eye candy, the fact that introducing green infrastructure, introducing particularly for us vertical green infrastructure into cities actually has huge sustainability benefits. And some of those are extremely measurable. Other, other than those are not potentially so measurable, but actually um, are still beautiful and have that impact. So um, our mission as a business is to reconnect people with nature. I've got loads of slides to show you and 20 minutes in which to do it. So I'm going to battle through these slides really, really quickly. And just to show you some of the work that we do and some of the ways in which we are seeking to reconnect people with nature and the reasons why we do that. So the benefits both to people and to business and to the planet. Biotecture is a 15 year old business now. Um, we do uh, operate a triple bottom line business model. So um, we, are, we are really concerned about our environmental footprint as well as our social footprint. Um, as well as being a business. What we do when we work with green infrastructure and bring it into spaces, into the cities, is that we're working in places that have limited uh, space, uh, spaces at a premium, actually literally and financially in the middle of the city. So where is it that we can put green infrastructure? Well, if we can narrow down the square areas of, of space that we're taking, i.e. by putting on roofs or walls, um, we can then make a dramatic difference by introducing green infrastructure into those spaces um, without uh, taking up too much uh, a floor area. And every time we do that, we're looking to beautify spaces and rich spaces, but we're also looking to add in other sustainability benefits as well. Um, and I'll run through a few of those in a second, but I think the important thing to do is look at the holistic nature of bringing green infrastructure back in as part of um, um, our, our clients and our, our response to the climate emergency, we think a holistic uh, requirement is needed. So we all know the state of the world. I won't dwell on this too much in terms of in terms of where wh why we need to do what it is that we need to do with green infrastructure. Um, and I'm sure these slides can be can be shared as well. 
One of the interesting things for me, I think, is where we're almost emperor's new clothes, no clothing at the moment, is looking at the impact of climate change over the next uh, 28, 29 years, when uh, some of the some of the changes in climate within our cities are going to be quite striking, with London having the same climate as Barcelona, for example, in 2050. And 2050 is in 27 and a half years, in fact, less than 27 and a half years time. And yet we're still building the concrete, glass and steel, and we're still, uh, in, we're still um, using air conditioning, which is primary energy costs. Um, we are not disconnected from, from nature. Anytime we think we are, just, just look at that graph there. Um, and one of the things that we come across is where funding comes from for clients and where clients' views of sustainability are at the moment. And a lot of it's about net zero carbon. Whereas we all know that there may be one financial bottom line, but there are multiple environmental and social bottom lines and they're all interlinked. And we don't know which one's gonna tip which, which one over. So focusing on one narrow, uh, area of net zero carbon could have a catastrophic impact elsewhere. So what we're all about is holistic sustainability. And when we put green infrastructure in, we see that we have the ability to create all of these benefits. And so we have, we created a, um, a range screen cladding system 15 years ago to go on the outside of buildings and, and suddenly realized that we created a range screen cladding system um, that could provide multiple benefits, um, both to the inhabitants of the building and people who go past that building. There are no other cladding systems that can perform more than one, potentially two of these things all at the same time. So this is why for us green infrastructure is really important and why these holistic benefits are, are, are important for us to recognise. What is it about green infrastructure? We, we all know this, but just a reminder for us, and this is what I talk to our clients about, it's about the physical science, it's about the properties of plants themselves, the fact that at a global scale uh, plants give us the perfect cocktail of, of, of air for our lungs to breathe. We are living symbiotically there. Um, uh, it provides us with shelter, with food, uh, building materials, etc. And that leads on to the biophilic connection, which is the fact that, you know, even looking at nature reduces our heart rate and our blood pressure. The fact that we are intrinsically connected. We then talk about those two factors being combined. Uh, leading on to the holistic multiple benefits um, and then talking to clients about returns on investment and how that can work. Urban environment where we work, it's Arab Cities Alive uh, document is very uh, important for us in terms of showing where we work, whether it's green roofs, pocket parks, linear parks, uh, and vertically where we work, which is the green infrastructure on the outside or inside buildings as well, uh, where we can put that together. We work externally in a retail environment. We work internally. Um, this is uh, uh, Centrica's head office in, in Oxford, where you can see the sort of British gas flame running up the middle there. Um, and from a science point of view, um, we know that green infrastructure adds value across this whole spectrum. Um, we have scientific uh, backup that shows, shows that data. Um, but uh, And we're looking at two areas. We're looking at mitigation, so basically this mitigation for us is, is things that we as humans have really got, got wrong within our cities and how can, we, how can we deal with that? We're also looking at enrichment because it is you know, making the world a better place to be in and a greener space actually is enriching for us. It's good for our well-being, And from a um, National Health Service point of view is a mitigation impact in terms of the number of people needing either mental health um, uh, help or physical health because green infrastructure gives us all of those bits and pieces. Um, Bunch of science. We've got a whole bunch of science on what, on what our element of green infrastructure does, whether that is um, thermal impact, air pollution reduction, biodiversity, enrichment spaces, or whatever it might be. But I think it's really, really important that we, we recognise this fact from, uh, uh, or this statement from, from an award winning um, psychologist that it is far better to make the world a better place than it is far easier to make the world a better place than it is to prove that you've made the world a better place. That, is, that should never be dismissed um, as an argument in terms of how we intrinsically feel psychologically when we're connected with plants and how that then is potentially measurable. And so our basis is, you know, let's focus on the positive. Yes, we've got to contradict some of these negatives, but let's focus on the positive and create an environment that is actually wanted, that we want to have. Why would we not want any of these things that sit down on here anyway? So I'm just going to run through just a few of these areas where um, we work, and I'm going to focus on the external environment, although we have a similar sort of set of slides for the internal, um, just looking at where some of these sustainability benefits come in. And the bottom one there is enriching environments. And in everything that we do, we want to enrich the environment. We want to make places and spaces better for people to come into. So if I look at air quality, just to start with, 
project here in Southampton um, on, on the busiest roundabout for articulated lorries in the country. Um, we know when we go back to some of the data and, and look at some of the impact um, or, or the places where we can bring green infrastructure from an air pollution point of view, urban street canyons being spaces where the width between buildings is less than the height of them and polluted air can endlessly circulate. What is it that we can put in there to capture that air to take it out of our system that isn't our lungs? And this is where green walls can become very interesting because they're providing that 12 month of the year greening, again, without taking out much of the floor space. I'm not decrying trees at all. I think trees and hedges, et cetera, et cetera, are all part of the solution. But when we come to the ultra urban zone, we need targeted green infrastructure for those targeted locations. And that's where we, um, but that's where we work, if you like. Um, example of this is Edgware Road Tube Station, um, and this is underneath the Maryland flyover. It was identified in 2011 as one of the six most polluted hotspots in London. Um, we looked at, uh, this, is a, this is a CGI image that we put 15 plant species on, and then we installed it uh, onto that system, and, uh, and it's, we're still looking after it today. It's now 11 or 12 years old. Um, and Boris, um, in one of his previous roles, commissioned this wall and, and actually said something uh, correct here, where he's correctly identified the twin aspect of the living wall, not only uh, capturing air pollution, but also beautifying the spot around that area. And those, those, those are both really important. If I'd long run to talk to you a bit more about this. Um, some work we did with the April Group in London, so air pollution reduction in London with Imperial College. Um, this is basically uh, leaf capture, looking at particulate matter, uh, PM10s in this in this instance across the 15 species, which species are best for particular. And this gives us a starts to give us a suite of plants and a set of species that we can start to use if we need to start thinking about capturing air pollution. When we talk about thermal benefits, um, again, this is a project um, in Southampton Row in, in Holborn, where actually, if you look at the bus here, uh, one of the uh, busiest bus routes in London comes down Southampton Row in Holborn. The plants that were selected for the, on this project for air pollution reduction, but you can also see on the right hand side here the thermal impact that that is having where on the planted facade, we are about 20 degrees cooler um, than, the, than the adjacent building. And so not only are we on the facades, but we're also starting to look at how we can look at using virtual green systems for energy saving in buildings. And this is one of the papers that I identified earlier. This is some work in Spain, in Barcelona. Um, where uh, the energy potential for this concrete cube to keep it at 24 degrees with air conditioning, uh, it, the saving is 58.9% is and the heating in winter, there's also a saving in terms of ameliorating that temperature. Now we think, okay, so that's in Spain, what difference does that make? If you remember the climate change graph in 2050, London will have the same climate as Barcelona. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna have air conditioning or are we gonna start thinking about biological filtration systems for some of our buildings and cities? We all know about the urban heat island effect, and we all know about the instant of heart rates going up when the temperatures are higher um, and also when pollution is higher as well. Biodiversity, we know which species we can use and which we can put in here or dwell on this. We can also put in biodiversity habitat boxes as well to attract um, particularly invertebrates um, or solitary bees and various other um, creatures. So we can, you know, the, from a biodiversity point of view, we can have uh, installations like this one in Leeds where we've got 160,000 plants nearly and 750 habitat boxes within there. We're starting to create vertical forests and being able to do this from a fully sustainable reason. And we want to do more with this as well. And um, if you talk to anybody in the city of London, they will tell you that stormwater uh, capture is one of their biggest uh, targets. What we can do with uh, green infrastructure is start to uh, look at actually storing um, water within living wall systems. And we're creating a system now where we, we've created a system now where we can store uh, 15 litres of, of water per square metre within the living wall. We can have that intelligently watered. So if there's a rain event about to happen, we don't irrigate, we allow ourselves to capture that and take that in. And then we're actually using the water on site. So there's actually no need for that disposal there. Um, so all those are sustainability factors, there are many more, but there's also enriching environments and it's really important that we do that. It's not a new thing, think uh, Hanging Gardens of Babylon 4,000 years ago, we're looking to create spaces that people really want to be in. And the example I'll give you here is um, Regent's uh, Regal House, which is the entrance to Covent Garden. Um, this building was due to be knocked down um, and then rebuilt. 
Uh, but Covent Garden came to us and said, in the meantime, what can you do uh, to make that more um, appealing or make this, this place more appealing? We created this vertical garden as the entrance to Covent Garden. Immediately dwell time went up, which is the time people spend in an area because they're looking at it. Um, and uh, the, the client, um, Covent Garden, went from a, uh, a temporary planning permission for the Green Wall to what is now a permanent planning permission and have shelved their uh, plans to redevelop that site because they think it looks fantastic as it is. Um, it's a real gateway building now, saving them tens of millions of, of pounds of redevelopment. So there's a, there's a value factor to that. Um, Living Hoardings is somewhere we're working a lot at the moment. Um, this is along the Cycle Superhighway in Farringdon. Um, we put a photo montage together. Uh, we start to think about some of the messaging we can put on that green wall about, because um, I think empowering and enriching people with messaging is really good too. We put it in construction, it's just a um, stackable modular system, and that's how it looks when it's in operation. So we have a, you know, a green wall that is there, air pollution reduction again, uh, there for the cyclists, but also we're supporting the circular economy. Um, that green wall isn't a throwaway green wall, about a quarter of it's gone onto the seventh floor of the building of which it was a hoarding, um, and the remainder has been gone to a local school where they can repurpose the plant boxes to grow your own, uh, to get involved, to get, get their hands into it, to start to think about some environmental stewardship that sits in and around that. Um, internally, we work as well, but I'm not going to go through as many slides on this, but the enriching environment thing is really important as well. And actually, internal environments, the sustainability benefits are far easier to calculate because you have a much more of a closed system. Um, you're able to measure the air quality and the air and you're able to actually almost sort of police your inputs and outputs that come into a building. Although one of the interesting things that we look at is um, obviously ventilation strategies within buildings, particularly closed buildings, require 10 litres per, per second per, per square metre or whatever to come into a building. Um, where is that air coming from? Uh, usually outside, and usually it's polluted city air that's being brought in as so-called fresh air. So what could we do with biological filtration systems that will allow us to have fresh air within buildings? And then also to have this enrichment and this, the increases in productivity and creativity are just extraordinary when you start to think about what you can do um, uh, when you're surrounded by plants because of that biophilic element of it and this feeling of natural affinity with being surrounded by plants. The number of experiments that, that, that are there around Productivity and creativity particularly are absolutely overwhelming and show a 10% increase in, in both functions or faculties um, when we're surrounded by plants. So from an enriching environment uh, point of view, the, uh, the, the slide that I would want to show just to uh, show up how this works really properly is, is this project we worked in um, Heathrow Airport back in 2016 in a gate called the departure gate called the Garden Gate. Um, and uh, for three months prior to our installation, they had a happy face, sad face machine, and for three months afterwards, a happy face, sad face machine. So 250,000 people going through this departure gate. Um, and the percentage of people who were happy or very happy with the gate went from 47% to 72%. Um, and I think that's a really significant number um, in terms of how people feel about going through um, or, or being in, in, in around green infrastructure. So really we're looking at these multiple benefits. We're looking at this holistic way of looking at green infrastructure that provides benefits across all of these points. So when we have a client who comes to us and says we need to start thinking about biodiversity, um, then we can say, okay, that's great. And we also know that we're gonna be providing some element of placemaking and also air pollution reduction. We also start to talk about return on investment. We, a big project we've done recently in Canary Wharf, um, where we've done multiple installations within, within Canary Wharf has allowed us to show massive return on investment um, for that potential. Going forwards, where do we see the future of green infrastructure? I'm going to finish with this, about three slides just to finish, but where do we see the future of green infrastructure? Um, the first place we see it is in building biomembranes. We need to design uh, buildings that are fit for the future and uh, biological shading, uh, is, is, a, is a way forward <clears throat> that doesn't require the primary energy use of air, of air conditioning. Um, and it also provides visual access to nature, which is really important for us in our lives as well. Placemaking and wayfinding, as we come to 2050, 75% of the population will be living in urban environments. Are we creating environments that are fit for people to thrive and not just, not just survive? Um, can we bring nature into the cities? Can we encourage 
environmental stewardship through uh, placemaking and wayfinding and getting people back in contact with nature. And combining the two things, so this is combining um, um, uh, both building biomembranes and placemaking and wayfinding. This is my favourite visionary architect, Vincent Caliber. This is his vision of Paris in 2050, when Paris is set to have the same climate as Dakar, the capital of Senegal. Um, so really dry, uh, dry periods with intense rainfall events. Are we creating environments that are fit for these climates to, to come upon us within 27 years or possibly sooner? I can just take this time to introduce our next speaker by the time Richard comes back and finishes his presentation. So um, you heard about uh, you know, the indoor and outdoor greening. So we got a colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Amy Owen, who is a senior research scientist at NGI with a background in environmental science and is currently working in the field of nature-based solutions and climate adaptation. So she has a keen interest in working across uh, disciplines to find solutions to complex challenges currently society is facing. Uh, Dr. Owen is project coordinator of the Horizon 2020 Innovation Action, which is called uh, Figuous. Uh, which she's going to be presenting some of the case study here. Um, Amy, maybe um, you can just start in the interest of time and, uh, you know, we can accommodate, uh, you know, Richard later on. Certainly. Thank you very much for that introduction, Prashant. I uh, share my screen and I believe it is in the uh, correct the mode right now, yes? Yes, that looks perfect, yeah, please go okay, ahead, thank good. you. I will go ahead, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to share with you uh, today the Horizon 2020 EU project Physicus, which means according to nature in, in Greek. And uh, it's looking at nature-based solutions to reduce hydrometeorological risk in rural mountain areas. And um, although I'm the coordinator, there are significant contributions to this presentation from my, from my colleagues at NGI, uh, Bjorn Kalsnes, Anders Solheim, and Victoria Capobianco. So I think it's worth revisiting just briefly Nature-Based Solutions, uh, the definition, because this project as an EU-funded project, it, it's developed out of the context of the Commission's original definition, which was in its roadmap back in 2015, where uh, nature-based solutions are in inspired and supported by nature, and relying very heavily on emphasizing the co-benefits of environmental, social, and economic benefits. But now there's been this uh, global movement, if you will, where nature-based solutions as an umbrella term has really um, become quite prominent in recent years. And as such, to coordinate better with the, the intention of nature-based solution. This uh, definition has expanded to really emphasize that biodiversity um, needs to be enhanced and improved with these solutions. And this has been really useful as we, as we inter interact with stakeholders when they really want to know well, what is a nature-based solution. And, and you can emphasize the outcome that should enhance biodiversity at a, at a given area. And with that said, it's also useful that we recognize that a lot of these interventions aren't necessarily new. And so as an umbrella concept, um, nature-based solutions is building on um, earlier terminology that goes back tens, if not hundreds of years. And these different terms really come from the different disciplines that they've been developed under. And so my colleague, Victoria Capibianco, is a co-author in this particular article in Ecological Engineering, where they go through this development of the different terms and concepts and why nature-based solutions do fall in the, for example, soil and water bioengineering as well. So it's, um, we recognize that, and I think it's really important to, to have that, uh, to be a bit humble with the, the term as well. So for physicals, we're looking at nature-based solutions to reduce natural hazard risks from the extreme weather events. And this focus is based on the fact that we see uh, damage costs from these types of events are very high and are increasing. And the impacts of climate change will, of course, um, worsen the situation. 
traditional engineering concepts are costly and perhaps lacks the flexibility that are needed to tackle these changes. And as well, they have a negative impact on ecosystems. And so this project evolved out of the fact also that nature-based solutions have been available, maybe on a smaller scale, but there was a need for upscaling to tackle um, more uh, natural hazards at the landscape at the landscape level. And our project in particular is focusing on mountain areas. And the reason we uh, decided on this is because the mountains are really amplifying these risks. So uh, extreme hydrometeorological events in mountain areas do impact the entire river basin and they can trigger uh, rapid moving mass gravity flows, for example. And by managing these issues higher in the, say the mountain regions, we indeed can help uh, reduce risks downstream in the watershed. And also since mountain regions haven't really received as much attention as the urban areas and nature-based solutions in urban areas, there was this window of opportunity to, to improve the, the research and the, the evidence base on these types of solutions. So just really briefly, it's a EU project organized in different work packages with the case study sites really at the core of the project. We're 15 partners from seven countries and this four-year project has become a five-year project with the pandemic with a budget of about 10 million euro. And for these implementations, our case study site partners also come with co-financing co because they are uh, costly. And so what I thought I would do is just give a brief um, overview of what the cases look like and some of the interventions that are being implemented. We have five sites throughout Europe where three of them are large scale demonstrator case study sites in Norway, uh, the Pyrenees with France and Spain and in Italy and the Circio River Basin. And then there are two smaller cases that we identify as concept cases. This is the Isar River Basin in Germany. And this is our retrospective case where we've learned on the stakeholder processes they've implemented in the river basin. And the countertail case, which is really uh, implementing field pilot tests to reduce erosion uh, due to glacial retreat. So if I just share a little bit, we take a trip first uh, to Norway and the valley of Gudbrandsdalen. And within this valley, there are several interventions that are ongoing. But here you have a, a nice picturesque uh, photo of the valley in really the center of Norway. But in 2011 and 2000, uh, 2013, there were uh, significant uh, flooding events with quite high damage losses. And, and this triggered a process where this county put forward a regional plan for, um, for the area and how to reduce this flooding risk. And at the time when this plan went out, it was quite um, innovative for Norway, looking at uh, risk in this large uh, scale. And this plan was published about the same time as the project proposal. So it lists many interventions. Some are very traditional gray interventions, but some of them were quite nice and could be classified as a nature-based solution. And we were able to take these forward in the project. So along this, the Good Brandsdalens the the river that you see, there's four sections that have been identified for potential nature-based solutions. The G1 in the, the lower part of the photo is in an area called Uriksplad, which is very close to Lillehammer, if you're familiar with the, the Winter Olympics uh, some time ago. And here it was recommended to establish a green receded flood barrier, which I will touch on. And then slightly further north, uh, an area called Bayer, looking at flood and erosion control. So the green receded flood barrier, it's a side river called the Gausa, which has a very important habitat. And this particular area does um, uh, experience flooding, mostly yearly, I would say. And what you see is from the, the photo above, it's become quite channelized, this river. Uh, compared to an earlier aerial photo from the late 60s where there was more space for the river and, um, and the riparian zone was more developed. And what has happened is some um, important species have disappeared. 
So the idea was to remove an existing gray barrier at uh, right at the where this Gauss River goes into the Good Grounds of Logan, and then that uh, existing flood barrier you see it as a blue line and a white line in the photos, and then establish a receded barrier uh, to allow more space for the flooding. And these FP areas are the floodplains, so establishing the riparian vegetation and hopefully then um, for the red listed species to come back. And then what's also important to recognize though is that there is some agricultural land in this area. It is flooded uh, today, but of course this uh, would be more uh, flooded when um, it doesn't have any place to recede though when you get this flood barrier. And then this is a, an issue that also needed to be addressed. We have a landscape architect as part of the project and provided these uh, illustrations to, uh, to, uh, to show how it could look. And the idea was um, an elevated barrier that was accessible for the, the local people, that they could walk along it, but then having these interconnections uh, between the area within and out and how, how you could uh, move between these two areas. Unfortunately, uh, I could say that that, uh, that intervention did not get implemented and I will get back to that because it's very much related to the barriers. So we move a bit further north to a year and here it's an, um, an area that used to be a gravel pit, but it's now being developed into um, some housing. And part of these measures are to reopen a creek that has been uh, buried add vegetation and also construct a sediment uh, basin, basin downstream that could be a park area for this new housing complex. The, it is in progress and what one of the issues that has been discussed is what type of vegetation to use because as was previously, previously pointed out by Richard is you have this changing climate and what can we expect in a, in a future climate in this area. So they're testing out two plots where uh, local vegetation in the one and then some vegetation that's not an invasive species, but still that thrives in a more southern uh, Norwegian climate is also being tested with regard to uh, reducing erosion in these areas. And this work is ongoing and here is just some photos of, of what it looks like uh, today. The, the housings that are there, they have been established previously and it's behind them that are being built. And in tandem to the right of the photo there, you see how the, this, the, the creek is being uh, dug up again and the sedimentation basins established. So this is in progress. We move now a bit further south uh, to the Pyrenees. And, um, and this is a nice example because it's uh, established looking more at the steeper slopes which also are relevant in Norway, but, uh, but uh, here are the cases from the Pyrenees. And what I'd like to point out in this nice photo, this black and white photo is, this is an example from uh, uh, NBSs that were established in the early 1900s. And you see in the insert in the photo, uh, uh, an area in this slope that's uh, very vulnerable to erosion and landslides. And what they did is drywall terraces and drainage systems and adding um, vegetation, trees and, and other brush. And then the photos on the right are from a, a relatively recent excursion to the area. And what you see is that it's, it's lush, it's green, there's an ecosystem here. And in this particular area, they do not experience the landslides that were problematic uh, earlier. So this is the future of what the, the solution uh, we foresee in this particular area in Santa Elena, which is located along a road that's quite important, a road between France and Spain. And it's a high risk uh, area because the slope is in glacial till and the, the road has low visibility and there's often rocks. So this uh, terracing and the drainage is ongoing and the vegetation will be implemented soon. And here you have an, uh, a live camera to watch the progression of the building. This was taken in June and July. So you see the first, uh, say first terrace is being built and then the vegetation will come. Another area in the Pyrenees are uh, rockfall hazards. 
So they are a bit different uh, to, to mitigate. And here at this case study site, they are looking at hybrid measures. So there are some gray measures, but also NBS using wooden structures and managed, say, the forest management along these wooden uh, structures. And the idea here is to build up test uh, structures so that they can have an area to, to provide uh, visible proof to local decision makers on what the interventions look like and how they function. Because what they've seen here is there is a, a lack of, of, say, confidence in using this type of uh, interventions for these slopes. So this is what's being established um, in this area. And also looking at steep slopes, there's uh, snow avalanches is also a, a relevant hazard in the Pyrenees. In the Cape forest, the idea is to replace some of the snow fences that are there because they are a bit too low with regard to the release area of avalanches and they require a lot of heavy, heavy maintenance. So they're looking at local plant species that could adapt to the higher altitudes. And these are currently being planted in the released area, but they also need to be protected with these tripods while the, while the trees uh, can become established. And this is just the, one of the challenges with nature-based solutions is they do take time to become established and be effective. And um, so this is a support system to help with that. I referenced some barriers to the uptake and implementation of nature-based solutions. And it's, um, I think it's an important part to, to point out because we can't oversell nature-based solutions at this large scale. And then to be quite uh, clear about how they can reduce risks. There is a nice article by the Therabi that came out uh, focusing on urban uh, context where 15 different types of barriers have been identified. And in the Physicus project, we've, we've experienced many of these as, as well as some others because of this large scale implementation uh, that we're looking at. And I thought I would just use this, ex, um, the receded green barrier as an example. The highlighted list here illustrates many of the barriers that we in fact have, um, have run across and unfortunately resulted in the project having to be put on hold. And they could be summarized by some of these um, yeah, points on the right. And in general, we see that there is a lack of knowledge on their effectiveness. So, and then that leads to some skepticism to nature-based solutions. And unfortunately in this area, um, there was a misalignment between the short-term and the long-term goals because two counties were merged during this process. And this did impact uh, the decision-making process a bit negatively. There, it also, as it moved to the detailed design and looking at the actual costs, the original budget estimates, they were too low. And as such, um, there was too little funding available to move forward with the implementation. And again, this, um, the landowners with the loss of the agricultural land and some land landowners indicating that they would object to the intervention. These um, made the municipality a bit uh, say they weren't sure that they could move forward with the intervention. And then finally, this other factor that was quite unique for this area, but it does touch on something that needs to be assessed is for certain, for certain say stakeholders, the flooding is actually advantageous. And in this area, it, um, the erosion leads to the transport of uh, a type of gravel that's actually quite, quite good and nice. And, um, and what they do is they extract the gravel and sell it for quite a, a profit. So by uh, making room for the river, they reduce the erosion. And then, of course, they reduce this uh, source of income that they have. So, so this also was, um, yeah, was a, something that was a barrier to this intervention. While there are barriers, I think it's worth to, to look at the other side of, of the coin at what are the enablers that help us actually to, to, uh, to reach a successful intervention. We have uh, partners in the, the research project that have looked at this, looking at three different case study sites. 
the ESAR in Germany, which was our retrospective case, uh, Nortella in Italy, which looked at the a landslide, and Wulang in China, which looked at forest management. And all three of these areas had very successful NBS implementations. They're quite different with the hazard and the, the intervention, but what they found, there were some commonalities or success factors, enablers. There was political will and support in all of these cases. They saw that there were polycentric uh, governance arrangements, meaning that, that different governmental uh, organizations and other organizations worked across uh, horizontally and vertically um, in all dimensions. Stakeholder engagement was high with the co-design. There were coalition and ad uh, advocacy groups, as well as they were quite successful in raising awareness uh, through different events. So I would just like to, to highlight on some of the innovation tools that are available, and I invite you to visit our website. Um, if you're interested in some of the processes, we focused it on uh, stakeholder involvement through a living labs, the technical innovations and using a framework to assess the nature-based solutions prior to the implementation, these governance innovations and looking at the policy and the regulatory opportunities that are there. There are some outputs, a visual reality game, as well as a serious game simulation for engaging uh, decision makers, and also an inventory where we're trying to increase the number of solutions in a database that will be linked together with, uh, with the other sister projects that we're working with to provide um, some legacy for the project as well. So just in summary, with these nature-based solutions, it could be worth uh, repeating the need to plan well ahead because uh, the large-scale implementations do take a, a lot of time. They're crossing, um, they're crossing many different uh, boundaries with regard to regulations as well as land ownership. And the procurement process along with that then also can be very time consuming. Your stakeholders are very important, bringing them in early and uh, from scratch if possible, but not in the least using their local knowledge to identify areas that are prone to natural hazards. And they also have good ideas for their solutions. And we found this at some of the other case study sites. And then they can be our ambassadors for the project but also identifying stakeholders that could be problematic and having strategies on how you're going to engage with them. Uh, for us, our experiences, public land is advantageous um, if uh, you want to move forward quickly. So if possible, select public land. And then uh, really the acknowledgement that nature-based solutions do take time to become established and therefore effective. So you need to think in the short term as well as the long term and also establishing these monitoring programs to document the, the nature-based solutions so that we can have, have as uh, well-established documentation as for the urban context, which was presented so well uh, earlier. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to share a project and then I will stay online and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to pass on to my colleague Thomas uh, for taking it from here for the question and answer, but also possibly um, let Richard finish his presentation. Sorry, Richard, we missed you um, because of the internet issues. I, Thomas, yeah, over to you. Richard, I, I think we should let Richard, uh, I think he was building up to his crescendo, so I think we should let him finish. <laughs> I, I have no idea where I got to. when You had a, a slide with lots of pictures and you said you had three left. Oh, okay, great. That sounds about right to finish, isn't it? Let me do that then. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, so I'm just going to do the um, conclusion, really, which I was building up to. Um, just three areas we think that the infrastructure needs to go within our urban environment. And it was fascinating listening to Amy talking about the barriers um, that she has in, 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 in the um, more natural non environments of the misalignment of short term and long term goals. Um, how do we prove performance of what's going to happen? Um, and then the whole financial issue of where the incentives for the people, people doing it. And I think it, it's, it's fascinating how, how those combine. And for us in, in cities, building biomembranes are really important. Um, 
this idea of um, uh, being able to biologically filtrate um, even sunlight so that we're shading in winter so we can grow deciduous species. For example, in the bottom right here, you can imagine deciduous species growing up here that are blocking sun in the summer and allowing uh, the light to come through in, in, in the winter and therefore reducing primary energy use. And I think it's really important that, that we have that in our cities so that people have a view of green from their, from their house or wherever they might be. Um, because the second point is about placemaking and wayfinding. Um, as we have more and more people coming into the urban area, um, by 2050, again, 70 75% of people will be in ultra urban zones. Um, are we creating spaces in which they can thrive, in which they've got access to nature, um, in which um, we, can, we can really engender that spirit of um, stewardship, environmental stewardship, by connecting people with nature actually within our cities? And so placemaking wayfinding is proving to be quite an interesting way around that. And one place we're doing that is in Canary Wharf, uh, with multiple instances of infrastructure. Um, and that has just transformed that space from a five-day with concrete, glass and steel space in where there's, you know, and you've got the blue environment there as well as water. So this sort of whole idea of reconnecting people with nature and cities is really important. Combining those two of placemaking, wayfinding, and also building by membranes um, approaches. So, as Patient outlined earlier, there's a QA and a button at the uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can you can ask questions. Somebody already have, um, and I think I'll start with the question for um, for Richard. Um, so let me just find the, the question. Uh, so the question was, um, uh, the question is actually from the other speaker, but have you come across any geotechnical challenges when adding vertical walls to the built environment, especially when you're sort of thinking about refitting uh, old buildings? Uh, so geotechnical meaning um, connection with with the earth and structures etc um, generally uh, structural engineers get very um, um, concerned if we're re retrofitting to highways for example or bridges and so what we end up doing is providing independent frame structures that sit just in front of them so that they can go and inspect and do things like that and um, uh, in Mexico, they fitted green and green walls directly to um, overpasses, but in the UK, they shudder at things like that. And I imagine the same in, in Europe as well. Okay. Um, uh, so here we have a um, a question for for Amy. So the question is from Jan Pick, who asks, "Thank you for sharing the." Physicus project. Can you comment on what type of comparative system you are using to I think, prove um, the nature-based solutions um, is effective and cost-effective? Yeah, the, um, good question. We have developed an assessment framework, and in that framework, it's uh, uh, quite a lot of parameters that are quantified, say a baseline, and now as the interventions are tested out, then they will be uh, certain parameters will be monitored to say prove or if it worked or didn't work. And one thing to keep in mind also is as far as cost effective, it depends a little bit on, on what you include in the effective and how you cost that and the degree you, you uh, do the value setting of your ecosystem services. And then the other, a challenge we had with this question, um, particularly cost effectiveness, is this project is uh, focusing on reducing risk. And so we had quite a discuss discussion on that. That has to be maybe our primary focus, that the interventions need to reduce the risk aspect, whereas perhaps maybe the cost effectiveness comes, yeah, is less of a priority. So we're using the framework, but we don't have the answers to all of that as of yet. It is forthcoming. And because nature-based solutions take a long time to be implemented, it's a bit, I would say, uncertain how how many answers we'll have to, to that particular question. But yeah, it's a good point, definitely. Let's take another question here. So um, 
Alexandro de Saliant, I, think, I hope I pronounced that correct, uh, upload, uh, sent us a, a series of questions um, to the to the second speaker, and uh, I'm not going to select all of them, so I'm going to be, but this one I think is, is one I've, I've give you, Amy. So Amy, um, did you come across any unintended consequences or, or unforeseen consequences in the planning and execution phase of your project? Well, I would say maybe we were a bit naive with the barriers, so it's not really an unforeseen consequence. But um, but we this the first this receded flood barrier. We really thought this was the, going to be our. Yeah, our champion of the project because it had been kind of uh, decided on with the in the regional plan with stakeholders as a potential solution and 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 uh, the authorities were quite motivated at the county level and so um, we didn't foresee these the, the the fact of changing some of the planning and this um, uh, gravel outtake that that would really uh, yeah, have a consequence like that that this that there were air, there were stakeholders that benefited from the flood. I guess that was like an unforeseen consequence, but more in the planning stage, I would say. Right now, we haven't come far enough in any of the interventions to see unforeseen consequences of the interventions themselves. That I would say is a bit too too early to to identify. But um, yeah, I guess the the ones that have people discussed are, for example. Um, the increase in uh, bothersome insects, for example, in uh, in areas that you're adding uh, more vegetation, is what has has been mentioned. But we haven't come across that uh, as of yet. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a question here from Catherine Ford, and I think um, maybe we've touched upon that a bit before with the life cycle analysis. But the question is. Um, so actually, this is to both speakers. Can you elaborate on the evaluation framework that you use to show the benefit of nature-based solutions you're trying to, to persuade engineers to implement? Um, so what kind of framework have you put in place? What strategy is there to persuade people to try to use, or particularly engineers is the question, to use nature-based solutions? I don't know. Amy, do you want to go first? Sure, I could just uh, mention. So the, the framework that we're using is more of an, an assessment uh, framework. But I would have to say, I don't think it's the engineers that need the convincing uh, in, in the project. Uh, that's actually been um, in the different bids that have gone out for the most part. Um, they've been quite successful in getting several uh, bidders for the, the projects. It's more the, say, at the, the, the policymaker or decision maker, the governmental level, that they have confidence that they will be effective is where we've seen the, that they haven't been so, yeah, so keen to, to maybe implement the nature-based solutions. And an example in a parallel project, a national project, they wanted to implement um, some vegetation along a slope uh, over a railway. And the railroad authorities didn't even want to put up a pilot test because of the, yeah, because of the responsibility that, that uh, they would be taking on with that particular intervention. And then this goes back to a lack of national guidelines um, for how to ensure that you can say, yes, we've built this uh, veget you know, the nature-based solutions according to these particular um, yeah, requirements and standards. So that's where the, the gap is right now. So we can have our academic assessment framework, but really the work needs to go towards establishing national, national guidelines and standards for the engineers then to have, say, um, yeah, I think they're confident, but then uh, you, you kind of you go over to this regulatory responsibility uh, zone that there's uncertainty. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure in engineering liability is, is, a, is a big issue here. Um, I know there are more questions, but I think we have already run slightly over time here. So um, I think we'll put uh, 
Unfortunately, we won't get to all of them, so we put two lines under it here and, and thank both of our speakers for, for, again, for making excellent presentations and thank you for the audience for turning up and thank you for all the excellent questions. I'm sure we could have gone on discussing this um, for a long time. Over to you, Prashant. Yeah, so yeah, again, I think thank you very much for both of you for excellent presentations. Um, they have uh, you know, covered the very important topics, actually, and we are looking for you know, answers for, for some of those questions, so which you already covered. Um, I'm just wanted to finish this by announcing the next webinar. So we bring you um, the two speakers. So one comes from Malaysia. So uh, you will hear about the nature-based climate solutions for urban heat mitigation in tropical uh, in other countries. And the second speaker is from uh, Bangor University, Professor Thora Tenbring. And she'll be talking about uh, why uh, talking about places matters in times of climate change. So again, very exciting presentations. Please take a note uh, in your diary. And uh, um, if you have, uh, been on the Twitter or on LinkedIn, so you can follow uh, follow us for uh, the updates. And you can visit our website, which is reclaim-network.org, and you can find the sign-up form for the members and all the information related to the upcoming webinars and the links to store in your diary. So with that, I would like to thank both our speakers and uh, our question and answer uh, in a chair uh, for their fantastic job. We look to see uh, you in the next webinar. Thank you very much.